Their handmade pottery graced homes across 19th century Alabama, and the tradition continues today at Miller's Pottery in Brent. The Miller family is carrying on Alabama's longest-running folk pottery tradition. They have been turning pottery since 1865. Eric Miller grew up in a rural area and learned the family trade. Now he is passing on the tradition to his son, Steve. Back at that time, that's the way you, you know, you had a farm. All the families worked the farm, and we had a pottery. How everybody worked the pottery, you know. It's just, that was everyday thing was to work at the pottery. <laughs> Where we was at, there's, there's nothing there, you know, it was in the country. So you just around the pottery all the time, so there's nothing to do but <laughs> play with the clay. So you just more or less watch them and teach yourself. And when I come along, he's, he's just been doing it so long, it's just instinct to him. So he's not really realizing the actions that he's making. It's just uh, happening for him. And I'm trying to study each step there. And uh, it's just trial and errors, basically. The learning part is what's really frustrating. After you catch on, it's, um, it's actually you'll fall in love with it. It's a just really great feeling to create something out of just the mud. Abraham Miller, a Pennsylvania man, came to Alabama in 1865 and started the family business. Well, I hear it. Uh, Abraham Miller found himself uh, close to Mobile at the end of the Civil War, about dead. And, uh, a family, the Lacoste family, which was making pottery at Mobile, took care of him and they got him back to good health. And he fell in love with a girl and married her. And uh, that was Francis Lacoste. And he either learned how to make pottery with them or he already knew how to make pottery. But uh, they married and uh, they set out in a wagon, Abraham, Francis, and a baby north and they wound up in uh, Pickens County that was in the middle late 1800s and he pottered over there in Pickens County for several years and then he moved from there to Perry County and set up a pottery in Perry County and that's where he uh, stayed until he had uh, his boy uh, Will Miller got older and he took the pottery over, made pottery. And his sons, well one of them was my father, Hendon Miller, took a pottery, took the pottery over and he uh, made pottery there. And they fired with a uh, lighter pine at that time. And uh, my father heard about uh, natural gas over here in Bibb County running up and down the road. So he moved over here in 62 and set up a gas furnace where he wouldn't have to fire with pine. And uh, so I got old enough to uh, learn how to make pottery and I took it over and I'm still here on Highway 5 in Brent. And now I have a boy, Steve Miller, he's learned how to make it and guess maybe he will carry it on, you know. I didn't start at a young age. My father grew up around it, and it was uh, never was. I always found it interesting, but it was just an everyday thing to me. I never did get out there and really practice it. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I was wanted to be a motocross racer, but uh, the money part didn't work out on that. Racing is really expensive, so I went to making pottery to make money for racing, but I hadn't got back into that yet. <laughs> I just uh, started just a few years back practicing the pottery, so, uh, so I'm just now entering into it. Most potters I talk to say five to seven years before you really can master the art of it. Eric Miller's nephew, Alan Ham, like Eric, started working in the family pottery as a child. He fondly recalls the time when Miller's pottery was bustling with activity. I started doing this when I was seven, eight years old. We used to, we had an old shop in Sprott, and we'd come in in the evening and we'd make balls and stuff for them. So all that evening, where the next day, 
they would have uh, enough to go to about dinner before they would have to worry about making balls to make the pots. Well, it was, uh, it was my grandma and granddaddy and Eric and me, and then we had uh, Kenneth, he helped. And it, was, it was five or six people, you know. Then we had two or three more hired to help us with, with digging the clay and grinding the clay and stuff like that. Although he still comes by to turn a few pieces each month, Alan Ham has taken another job in recent years, leaving the bulk of the pottery operation to Eric and Steve. The raw materials for pottery have to be dug from the earth, but not just any clay will do. Most of the clay around here is uh, just the red terracotta clay, and um, we got used a stoneware uh, pottery clay, and um, that'll uh, make it watertight, which um, when we dig it by the shovels, which uh, most of the big companies now usually uh, use the machinery. The Millers dig their clay in Perry County at the same location used by their family for generations, then return to their Bibb County pottery shop to prepare the clay for turning. We uh, have to put it in a soaking pit. It comes out in really large lumps and we have to grind it up so we go ahead and soak it in the pit because we have to mix water with it anyway, so uh, just uh, pre-soaking to uh, sort of dissolve the lumps down to a, to a grinding state. And then we'll fill the mill up and then uh, mix water with it to bring the mill to an even texture, a consistency. Now my father started uh, using electric motors to turn a clay mill where he used to use a mule to turn the mill, you know, and had a mule going around and around all the day long, you know. <laughs> Takes a couple hours to grind it to it's like making cake batter, I suppose, get it to the right texture you need. You'll scoop them out with your hand um, and just sculpt these large um, cubed forms, and they usually weigh about uh, 7,500 pounds. Sometimes I take them out larger and dad fusses at me. <laughs> In the old days, a process called wedging was used to remove rocks and other debris from the clay. Come over the table and you would take clay and you would uh, slice it through this wire. You'd have two pieces of clay and you could pick rocks and sticks out of it with your finger, slap the clay back together, cut it again, pick some more sticks and rocks out of it, slap it back together, cut it, cut it, slap it, had to slice a piece of clay or ball, what we call a clay ball, up. Had to slice one about 20 to 25 times to get most of the big rocks and big sticks out. Of course, it'd always leave little ones. You couldn't get them all out that way. And uh, that was uh, a rough job, wedging clay. Today, the Millers have two machines which replace the wedging process. Now we have this uh, filter machine that will run it through a, a machine that presses it through screens to take out any rock or stick in the clay. And then we'll run it through another machine we call a pug mill. That takes the air out of it, it packs it and makes it a solid piece of clay again where you can use a, make a lump of clay, what we call a ball, clay ball, and we put that on a wheel and it can't have any any air in it to where we could uh, turn a, a pitcher or a bird out. In addition to producing clay for their own use, the Millers sell clay to art supply companies and schools across Alabama and Mississippi. We uh, started selling uh, clay to schools and colleges and, and art supplies. and. Uh, they think it's the best clay they've ever tried. That way the young people can uh, learn how to make uh, stuff, but they don't get the full enjoyment of producing the clay. <laughs> Mixed to the proper consistency, and with debris and air removed, the clay is ready for turning on the wheel. 
modern wheels are powered by electric motors. In the old days, potter's wheels were turned by pumping a foot pedal. The old kick wheels, uh, my father, all my uncles, they used to use them. And uh, when you was, they were commercial potters selling it to dealers to go up north and, and sell it. So they were to work all day long on a kick wheel. And you continuously had to pump it, pump it and to keep the, the wheel turning. So they was kicking with one leg all day long while they were turning. And uh, over a period of years, it would wear the hips out. But the weird thing, it didn't wear the hip out that they were kicking with. It wore the hip out that they were not kicking with. Making pottery on the pottery wheel, uh, learning to make a real gradual process. It's a learning to have a, a fluid set sequence of hand motions and hand positions. And you just have to develop a fluency um, <clears throat> in practice. It takes a lot of patience to, uh, to get the, the uh, consistent curvature of the shape that you want. And uh, the, uh, you have a picture uh, shape in your mind before you start. And, um, and what you come out with isn't going to be until you actually master the art. When you're uh, squeezing uh, each pull, making the uh, piece erect, bringing it up, um, the walls are getting thinner and thinner as it's growing. And um, the, you leave uh, a very small amount more in the bottom to support the, the weight of the top. And, uh, that's where the uh, master potter will be able to press it all out and trim very little off the bottom as the uh, studio potters nowadays usually trim a lot of their, their weight off. And after we finish uh, making the complete shape out of it, um, I'll have to take the water out with the sponge for it won't dissolve the clay in. And then we'll put a stripe of cobalt on it sometimes for decoration. And then we'll, um, make a little pouring spout. It's gonna take a while before you get the hang of it now, I'm telling you. That stuff don't, it, it, see when that, that wheel's spinning, that stuff just naturally just wants to slang off, you know. It don't want to come up or it wants to just, you know, go. And you got to just get control of it and you just, it's gonna slang away, but just, just getting mad. And, mean with it and get a hold of it. I like to broke my arm one time. <laughs> you get your wrist caught in it when it's, you know, a big one. But it, yeah, it, it's like you're wrestling with it, but once you, you get that, see, that's what I say, you start out with a small one and you get the feel of it and you work your way up to a 10 pound, you know, 15 pound, and then you, you all right then. But you start out with a 30 pound, it, you get your hand caught in there, it'll, it'll mess you up, hurt you. I learned it from just watching this fella used to help us. I never did get to see my granddad turn much, and as Kenneth Miller, I, I learned I turned like he turned. I just kind of watched him. What he always he just said, you know, just watch and then go try to make a piece like he just made, and that's what I did. I just when I caught time in between what I was doing, dinner time and stuff like that, I'd go on the wheel and try to make what he kind of piece he was making. And I said, that's how I learned. Now, he said you'd learn more than you sleep than you would trying to learn how. You slap your clay ball down on this uh, table, or wheel, what we call, uh, add a little water. The clay will slide in your hand. You have to apply pressure, a lot of pressure, to make this clay be perfectly round. I take my right hand and stick my fingers down through the middle of the clay, almost, and that's a lot of practice to learn, almost to the bottom. And you apply both hands on each side and give it an upward pull. You will put one hand on the inside, one on the outside. Left hand right on the outside, apply pressure and pull upward, upward and into the center at the same time. 
and this will bring your clay up to the height that you want. And then you uh, have to apply water. And then you can shape. After you get it to the heights you want, you can push with your inner hand, my left hand, outward, because it's centrifugal force wants to go at, make it go out anyway. And you can shape it, and that's with a lot of practice. And after you get it to the shape you need, then we have a, a device we call a chip, which is a, it's either a metal or wood chip. We'll take that uh, chip and we'll put it on the outside we'll, and uh, this smooths, smooths the clock. And you smooth it with a, with a chip and then uh, take all the excess water out with a sponge and then I sponge the outside of it to make it even more smooth. All the country people around uh, Alabama and other states, they like uh, to have a uh, purple mark to eat the, the mosquitoes. They are supposed to eat nothing hardly but mosquitoes, so uh, everybody grows uh, gourds to uh, have martin houses for the next year. Of course, a gourd won't last but one year because martins use uh, mud to uh, make the nest and it will rot the gourds out. So I'm here I'd make a, uh, this uh, martin, clay martin gourd that uh, is stoneware that will last forever. Pieces which have just been turned are very soft. They harden as they are sun-dried over a period of days. Well, after you turn a piece and we'll stack them on this, uh, place them on this board, we'll carry them outside and you have to, uh, you have to check on them about every hour to uh, turn them where you're drying them evenly outside. And uh, it takes uh, several days, it takes three to four days of uh, drying outside and then uh, you can bring them inside to be ready to, to glaze. The glazing is basically a decorative purpose, but it does have um, a functional purpose. Uh, for It makes the pieces easier to clean, and we use a lead-free glaze, which is perfectly safe to uh, eat out of, use in the cooking, and, um, but uh, we'll uh, dip them in the glaze, and we'll have to wipe the the surface is off that, that's going to sit in the kill because it's all going to turn to a glass state and uh, melt all together. And we sometimes wipe the tops off where we can stack the pieces where they won't stick together. When the glaze has dried, the pieces are ready to be fired in the kiln. The millers are using a relatively new gas-fired kiln which they designed and constructed themselves. Now, since I've got this smaller kill that temperature, you can get the temperature control better, I'm trying to get back into making uh, pitchers, churns, jugs, uh, plates, bean pots, and uh, bird houses. Make always make bird houses and a few flower pots. You have to take it out and place it in a furnace, trying to stack uh, pieces up in the furnace straight and steady then you uh, stack uh, as much as you can in a furnace and uh, after you've uh, stacked it full you can shut the door and uh, light the burners real low but you have to raise the temperature every hour over a uh, right about uh, 16 to 20 hour period till you reach your right temperature, what we're looking for is 30, uh, 2350 degrees. And I'll shut it off and then uh, two or three days and uh, cooling down to before I can open the door to see what the stuff uh, has done. I've opened the door and everything blowed to pieces and I've opened the door and be everything beautiful. So it's a, it's a waiting game. It's a, anxious time to, to open the door. Well, my great-grandfather was making pottery in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, my grandfather. Uh, they uh, <clears throat> were making 
pottery around uh, the community because the people in the community was farmers mostly and uh, they had to have their uh, uh, milk pitchers, uh, churns to make butter, plates to eat out of, bean pots to cook with. And uh, Potter was a, a community uh, person that uh, sold uh, stuff to the to the farmers and everyone else for their needs at that time because there was no plastic, no uh, not very little glass, and uh, they was community uh, potters. My father sold clay pots, containers. He didn't make many jugs, pitchers, and churns. He made mostly flower pots. He had some dealers in uh, Florida, and they sold uh, all over the state. I was learned to make pots, mostly pots, and I got on commercial type train. Uh, of course, each piece is individual. Each piece is a unique individual piece. But Steve spends more time on each piece. He's a more artistic potter and gets a little of the French and, and then a little of the Indian involved in his. Spends more time on each piece and decorates a little more than I would. The folk art, you know, I think that's a big part. I mean, it is my whole tradition, but um, I feel like I'm going to keep in that area. I'm going to branch off on my own decorative wear, you know. Uh, I think, you know, that's basically where the big money is, and uh, that's how I'm going to make a living. I've got to think about those things. My great-grandfather, Abraham Miller, started in 1865, and then his son was around him. that. Uh, figure back at that time there was not very many uh, picture shows around so he uh, played with clay and learned how to make pottery and then his sons which was my daddy uh, wasn't many picture shows around and he was around the pottery learned how to make pottery and I was around my father and very few picture shows around so I learned how to make pottery and uh, my boy has learned how to make uh, pottery, which is a good many picture shows around now, but uh, it's, uh, I don't know the reason we uh, still do pottery, but uh, Alan Ham always says it's, it gets in your blood, that if you ever learn how to do it, it's just hard to quit doing. So I guess that's the way my family is just, it's in the blood. Hopefully it's going to be a big enough business that I can do it full time. I might have to just do it as a hobby, if, uh, but hopefully I'm just be an artist, you know. You know, I'm the fifth generation potter, so I'd, I'd like to carry it on and try to get my uh, children one day interested in it, uh, and carry it on for another hundred years, maybe, you know.
For a videotape of this program, send a check or money order for $21 to the University of Alabama, P.O. Box 87000, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 35487. Or use your Visa, Discover, or MasterCard by calling 1-800-463-8825.